All right, good morning. Happy May. Can you believe it's May? It's May 3rd already. Like it's already May 3rd. <laughs> Where's the time going? It's going so quickly. Um, did everyone have a good weekend? Yeah. I did the math. I had six cakes this weekend. It was an amazing weekend. Six. Six actual cakes. Yeah. Well, I mean, I didn't eat the whole cake, but yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> We thought it was possible right now six different cakes. So, so my twins turned eight right so we got them two cakes here I, I took a picture of the cakes to share with you uh naturally right of all the things in life right there's their two cakes that they had so they had their actual birthday on sunday and we had two cakes there right one chocolate one white right but uh actually really neither of them it was more for me <laughs> i mean if we're honest here um my, my oldest loves chocolate cake the most. So uh, I had two cakes on their actual birthday and then they had their birthday party on Saturday and we had two cakes for that, right? Because, you know, different parties, different cakes. Um, and then we went to a softball party on Sunday and they surprised us with two cakes for them for their birthday at the softball party. Six cakes. It was an amazing weekend. And then there were leftover cakes last night and tonight and just a week of cake right so happy may <laughs> may's a good month so far i've had six cakes and it's only the third so uh, i can i count that as a pretty good month but um yeah here uh here's my little ones not so little anymore they're eight when did that i don't even know how that happened that they turned their eight my oldest one turned 10 is like turning 10 soon 10 going on 16. anyway um I had to show you the cakes, right? There, there are very, very little of them is left. I, I've done a good job. I'm ready to leave no cake, no cake left behind. Right? All right, I will close those up. But uh, I had to share them with you before, before we moved on. Uh, and then, obviously, if you're looking at our uh, at our syllabus, we are really, really down to it at this point. And um, I'll just be keeping track of that the rest of the way. Today's the third, so uh, we have today and Thursday, and then Tuesday is our exam. So we have this week. And then on Tuesday is our last class day. Um, we do have our test, so we're not actually meeting. Uh, the test will be online. I'll be here um, if you want to come check in with me or, or anything. But uh, today and Thursday and then Tuesday's our, our exam and then it's summer. So uh, yeah, we're really um, not a lot of time left, which is sad, but it's exciting that summer's coming. Summer's always nice. Uh, but what we'll do today, we'll wrap up the last slide or two that we have for uh, chapter 15. And then we'll move on to chapter 16, which is a forensic psychology. We'll be doing a little group activity uh, related to that that'll take us into next class. But um, that's it. So uh, I don't know, are there any questions about the, the last like days that we have or any like housekeeping kind of stuff before we jump back into, jump back into this? It feels like forever ago that we started, but it's it's gone quickly at the same time, right? Uh, long days, fast months. Uh, one or the other. I make sure I hit record. Yep. All right. Well, um, let's get back to this. So last time we uh, we ended talking about all the different dementias, right? All the different uh, neurocognitive disorders that we can have. Just a little bit about treatment, um, intervention, and prevention, and then we'll we'll be moving on. Uh, when it comes to treating these disorders, right, the different dementias, as we said, none of them are curable, right? So we can do little things to help slow them down. And typically these are only helpful in the early stages of dementia. So in the early stages of Alzheimer's in the, in the beginning years, we can give people medications that work on things like acetylcholine and dopamine, some of the neurotransmitters that are culprits, and they can slow the progression of the disease. But there's usually a point where those uh, medications don't really help anymore. And so at that point, somebody would go off of them and the disease just kind of progresses from there. So as it stands now, the treatments that we have are only kind of moderately helpful at best. Uh, but we do have some really like amazing new ideas on the horizon. There's a lot of research being done. When the ban on stem cell research was lifted back in 2009, uh, we just started doing massive amounts of stem cell research related to the dimensions. And stem cells are a special kind of cell that has the ability to divide for infinite periods of time. Uh, so the idea is that maybe we can use these stem cells to allow some new growth to occur in, uh, in the cells that have died off in the brain. 
And so that's something that we've been looking at quite a bit. There's also some new thoughts about uh, a lot of the ideas related to dementia have to do with diet, right? A lot of the current research is showing that uh, food choices are playing a huge role in the development of Alzheimer's, right? Not all of it, but you know, it, it is playing a contributing role. And there's some thought that there might be almost like a type three diabetes that we're seeing that has strong correlations to the dementias. Some of the newer treatments are actually focusing on insulin and sugar levels. So uh, it's interesting to see, but we have, uh, because this is something that affects so many people, there's just a massive amount of research being done on it. Uh, clinical trials for all sorts of different things. And so what we're seeing is that there's more and more research. Hopefully we have some like promising things in the future. Hopefully by the time most of us are in our 60s, 70s and 80s, we'll have you know cures or better treatments for these things. We also have some interesting like early intervention stuff. You can actually take a uh, blood test to see if you are more prone to developing things like Alzheimer's. And these tests aren't perfect. And I remember my mom and I had this conversation a couple of years ago when this was coming out. You know, she was like, you and your brother should go get tested so you can see if you're more likely to get it since your dad had it. And I was like, I, I don't want to know. Like for me, I was like, that would be like the worst possible thing if I found out that I was going to have Alzheimer's one day at who knows what age. That would just loom over my head. And these tests aren't perfect. They're just like the genetic uh, screening tests that we have for pregnancy, where you get a lot of false positives or false negatives. But just that, as a question to all of you, how many of you, if you had the opportunity to take a blood test today, and it would tell you, not with a perfect degree of certainty, again, it could be wrong, but it would tell you if you were likely to get um, a dementia or not. How many of you would want to do that? Just by show of hands, would anyone want to take a test? Yeah, a couple of you, anyone know? No way, not, not a chance. I'm assuming the rest of you maybe not sure. Any, why, why, why not? What do you, what do you think? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's where I'm at personally, but <laughs> yeah. Okay, so you would rather not know, right? Yeah. I'd rather not do like think I'll have the one I'm thinking of the one that has placebo effect. Sure. Right. Almost like you would have like a self-fulfilling kind of prophecy in a way. Other people, there were a lot of you like shaking your head. Any other other thoughts? Why you would want to take it or not not take it? I think the worst would be that you take it. And I, I could just think of every possible wrong scenario, right? Like it's like, oh, you're not gonna get it. So you you don't worry about the preventative efforts and then you end up getting it anyway. Or, um, you know, it says you are going to get it, you spend your whole life writing it and then it never happens, right? I, like, it just seems like until these tests are more um, accurate, like I, I would never want to do it. But there are all these new tests, like PET scans and blood tests that you can do that will tell you if you're more vulnerable. And, and again, I'm sure they'll get better and better as we move forward in time. Uh, but for now, the idea is if you know that you might be more prone to it, then you can really focus on those uh, preventative efforts. And there are a lot of preventative efforts that you can do that all of us can and probably should do that would help you to prevent or delay Alzheimer's. Now, if you are destined to get it, which is something that we don't know yet, right, then you know all of these things might not be enough. But you can do a lot of things that will delay it. And who's, not, who's to say that you don't live long enough to get it or that you delay it enough that like it just doesn't happen in your lifetime right so these are things that um, you know we all know we're supposed to do these are like the pillars of like being healthy right I just finished telling you I ate six cakes this weekend so I'm going to tell you about number two with a healthy diet right I, you know so we have to take those things into account right we do the best that we can but these are the things that we're supposed to be doing anyway you know exercise diet keeping mentally stimulated sleep stress management having an active social life all of these things are really good for your brain health. So when we exercise, it increases blood flow and oxygen throughout the body. It increases not only the quality of our life, but the quantity of our life. So exercise is really important, not only for your heart, but also for your brain and for your body. A healthy diet, as I said, diet has had a lot of research to indicate that diet plays a role in these different dementias, right, that we've talked about. Right. So trying to avoid like trans fats and saturated fats, eating a lot of like the omega-3 uh, fatty acids and the small meals throughout the day, eating across the rainbow, like making good food choices 
has been shown to have a really positive preventative effect. Now, you don't have to do this all the time, but in general, trying to make some of those good uh, choices with food can also be helpful and preventative. This one is huge, mental stimulation. By keeping your brain active and you're in school, you're reading, you're participating, you're, uh, you know, here, like those are amazing uh, protective things that you're doing for your brain. But uh, playing brain games and like mind games, staying stimulated. Every time I go to an escape room, I'm like, this is good for my brain. That's why I'm here. I haven't done one in a long time. I think I'm overdue. I'm at 94. I really want to get to 100, right? But uh, doing things like that are good for you or any kind of games. There's so many free and fun games on our phones that we can do that will keep you mentally active um, and kind of involved. I love this one too. Follow the road less traveled. I don't know about all of you, but I take the same route every day, no matter where I'm going. Like if I'm walking to my classroom, same route, driving to school, same way, right? Because it's the most efficient way, or it's just the one that I'm used to. Your brain does really well with uh, being like pushed when you take different routes, right? So if you have the time today or tomorrow or Thursday or whatever, walk to your next class a different way right? Take a different route to school, right? All of those little things form new pathways in your brain, which push your brain to grow and like be more used to um, diversity in a way, right? So trying to take the road, um, less travel or a path you don't normally take, uh, focusing on the five W's, the like who, what, where, when, why, how, all those things, like thinking about things in um, kind of a more developed way. Getting good sleep. Sleep is a big one. So is stress, I mean, think about when you have to take an exam. When you're stressed out, you don't think well. You don't think clearly, right? And so if you're not sleeping enough, you're not managing your stress, those things tend to be really impacting on our cognitive abilities. Having an active social life, people that you talk to and engage with and interact with, all of these things are kind of preventative measures. And as I said, diet is really, really becoming like a pivotal thing that we're seeing. Um, and so I can imagine that's going to gain more and more importance. But the more of these things that you do, the more like preventative and protective things you're doing for your brain and for your health in general. Um, and again, these are things we all know we're supposed to do, but they're not always easy to do. So uh, again, brain games, sleeping, exercise, diet, especially as you get older, right? When you start uh, to get into like your 40s and 50s, these are you know things you should definitely start focusing on um, as a way to help prevent. Uh, that onset of Alzheimer's. Now, it won't stop it, but it could delay it for, for years and years and years and years. Are there any um, <clears throat> thoughts, comments, questions, stories, anything else here related to uh, chapter 15? Yeah. It's, it's the idea of like one part of it is that you eat a bunch of small meals, right? So um, rather than eating large meals, like three large meals a day, you're kind of eating more like grazing in a way where you have lots of like little snacks and little uh, smaller meals throughout the day. And then eating a lot of like fish. And like, so you're avoiding a lot of the like processed foods and the foods that are high in saturated and trans fats. It's a whole like uh, dietary approach, right? So it's kind of certain foods that you're encouraged to eat and not eat and, and eating smaller meals throughout the day. Anything, anything else? Anyone have a favorite like um, mental stimulation game that you play on your on your phone? Like anyone have a, like games that you tend to play that uh, you would recommend that are good? Yeah. Yeah. I'm getting better at that. It took me a long time to get good at. Yeah. What's your first word that you use? Sauce. Sauce. I use um, house, right? Because it's got a, a few vowels. Right? That's sauce. I'm going to try that. Yeah. Wordle, it's a great one, right? Because you're trying to guess, you're thinking through other possibilities. Did you have one too? I was going to say Wordle. Wordle. Yeah. Right, that's a good one. Anyone else have a like brain game that you play on your phone or at all? I'm not good at the one with the numbers. Sudoku. I'm, so, I'm awful at that. Like That's another really good one that a lot of people do. There's one called Fast Math or Rapid Math that my daughter is obsessed with. Um, I've gotten obsessed with it because I can't seem to get an A on it. And that just makes me mad. I keep getting a B plus and I'm an A student. So I, I just like, I'm dedicated to this game because I want that A and it never comes. <laughs> it's so frustrating, but I keep trying. Uh, there's so many of them, right? There's just a million and there's a million websites as well. Those things are 
are really good for keeping your brain, brain active. Okay. All right. So we will leave a 15 behind. These are our, this is our last chapter. I'm a very sentimental person. I'm like it's the last group of slides, the last chapter. When we get to the last slide, I'll try not to cry. I, I won't cry. Uh, but it's sad, right? I mean, it's our last chapter. Exciting, but sad. Uh, and, and what we'll do in this chapter is we'll look at the intersections of psychology and the law. Anyone in here thinking about uh, going into forensic psychology? Yeah, do you have any idea what you wanna what you wanna do or just something in there? <laughs> yeah, yep. you got your hand up too. Same for yeah. you. I uh, I don't know what I wanna do, but I wanna do something in the criminal justice field. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, this is a really popular branch of psychology. I mean, a lot of people are really interested in in serial killers and criminal profiling and. Uh, the intersections of the law and psychology. There's so many amazing like documentaries and shows on, on Netflix. It's easy to go down like the serial killer rabbit hole, if you will. Um, there's a lot of that. And so what we'll do in this, uh, this chapter is we'll look at the two different sides of the coin. Uh, psychology affects the law and law affects psychology. So we'll look at both sides. And we'll look at some uh, famous insanity plea cases as well. Some, uh, uh, some scary and interesting folks that we'll, we'll look at. Um, and then some ethical principles at the end um, that psychologists and therapists have to keep in mind um, as they're practicing in the field. So uh, again, this whole branch is called forensic psychology, at the intersections between psychological practice, whether that's therapy or research or teaching or school psychology, and then also the judicial system, right? The legal system and the law. And I will tell you, I am not um, an expert in legal stuff, right? Um, I'm not trained as like a lawyer, have any like legal background. This can get incredibly complicated and be a very like case by case kind of thing. But what we'll do is look at some of the common verdicts that people sometimes um, will, will have that are related to psychology and mental illness. Uh, and then we'll look at some of the famous cases as well. So that's what we'll start with today. Uh, we'll look at how psychology affects the law, and then next time a little bit about how the law affects psychology. So two sides of the coin. So the idea in this first part, part one, is if somebody commits a crime, whatever that crime might be, how do we decide whether or not they should be tried or go through like a, a, like a trial process or like the legal process? How do we decide if they should go through that like everyone else? Or do they have maybe some mental illnesses or other things that we need to take into account to make sure that we arrive at like a just verdict or punishment? And that's not something that's easy to answer. Now, we're going to talk about insanity a little bit here on this slide. But when people commit a crime, are they capable of defending themselves in court? Do they understand the charges being brought against them? And sometimes people have mental illnesses or circumstances that make those things a no, right? They're not able to understand the charges against them. They're not able to defend themselves. Maybe at the time of the crime they committed, they weren't in their right mind. If someone has schizophrenia and the voices told them to commit a crime, should we try them the same way as somebody who was of sound mind and made that choice consciously? And the idea is no, right? That we, we shouldn't. They should have some kind of extenuating circumstance or we should take that into account, but this is a very messy, messy like branch, right? It's very difficult to decide if someone was sane or insane, if they were mentally ill enough to not appreciate the gravity of their choices or not. And people sometimes try and fake this too, which can make it even more, more complicated. So if somebody commits a crime, we have to decide, are we going to try them through the usual process or if they have mental illness, are we going to take that into account and then maybe go through a different process? And I love this picture, right? Uh, Mr. Evans, the speeding ticket, you can't plea insanity. You can't plea insanity for everything, but you do definitely hear about it in the media sometimes when people have like insanity pleas and so on. So this whole process, we're calling criminal commitment. If somebody has mental illness that we're taking into account, it's possible that they might be sent to a mental health facility, like a psychiatric hospital, 
something like maybe Shutter Island, but more contemporary, uh, rather than going to jail. Or maybe they go to jail, but they receive mental health treatment in jail. Right? So those are all things, again, that are possible and we have to take into account. And this first thing up here, uh, let's talk about insanity, and then I'll go up and talk about what not guilty by reason of insanity is. Insanity is a really complicated concept. And uh, this is a question I might ask you on the exam. Insanity is not a, a disorder, right? In, if someone is insane, they don't have a psychological disorder. Insanity isn't a psychological term. It's a legal term. When someone is insane or fits the criteria of insanity, they're fitting legal criteria that we've laid down, right? They might have a disorder that dictates them being insane, but insanity itself is actually a legal term, not necessarily a psychological one. And this is something that varies from state to state. So I have a kind of a general definition for you here. Insanity means that at the time of committing a crime, because of a mental disorder, a person did not know right from wrong or could not resist an uncontrollable impulse to act. So there's a couple of pieces there. This is at the time of committing a crime. So when the crime is occurring or when it's been um, committed, because of a mental disorder, so someone has a mental illness, typically something severe like schizophrenia, maybe bipolar disorder, uh, intense history of abuse, some things like that, something that's more intense. They either did not know right from wrong, right? so maybe they weren't able to appreciate the reality of the world around them, um, they weren't in control of their actions, or they couldn't resist an uncontrollable impulse to act. So if somebody is insane, we're saying that they meet all of those criteria. And the way that we would decide that is through having a panel of expert witnesses and psychologists who would um, evaluate that individual. They would do a lot of different assessment and screening methods and interviews. And we would decide, do they meet those criteria or not? And if somebody meets the criteria of insanity, then they could plead not guilty by reason of insanity. I'm not guilty of the crimes that I committed because I was insane at the time. I wasn't able to appreciate what I was doing. I wasn't in my right mind. The voices told me to do it. I was so um, distraught from the abuse that I suffered that I didn't even know what was happening. And so not guilty by reason of insanity is one that we hear a lot, where somebody um, says that I'm not guilty of the crime that I committed because I was insane at the time. Now, this is very, very rarely granted. Less than 1% of the time that it's pleaded is it actually granted. And we'll look at some famous cases that you would think there's no way this person wasn't insane and they will get um, a guilty verdict. Right? This is difficult, very difficult to get granted to you. Um, and a lot of people try to fake it. There have been people who have tried to fake having another personality. Oh, I committed those crimes when I was in a different personality. Doesn't hold up under, um, under like investigation or assessment. There have been people who've tried to um, fake having schizophrenia. The voices told me to do it. The dog told me to do it, right? Um, and that doesn't hold up in court. So a lot of people who have this diagnosis, typically it's schizophrenia or a past history of hospitalization or abuse, right? Abuse that uh, might've like compromised their state at the time. So it's very rarely granted, but it's the one that we hear of all the time right, not guilty by reason of insanity. And if someone is found not guilty by reason of insanity, they typically go to a mental hospital, a psychiatric hospital where they might spend weeks, months, years, maybe even the rest of their life until they're better or well enough to be released. Yeah? If a person is sent to a mental facility, let's say they <clears throat> murdered a bunch of people, so that would have been like a life, multiple life sentences. Yeah. So they go to the treatment, they get better within five to 10 years, are they just released after that or do they have to? Now, oftentimes, so if they're found not guilty by reason of insanity, then they would go to a psychiatric hospital until they're deemed to be healthy and stable and fine, and then they would just be released uh, because they were found not guilty. So there are other verdicts like guilty with, um, there's a couple of other ones that we'll talk about where they might go to a hospital and then they would go to jail after it once they're better. But this one, because you were found not guilty, you would receive treatment uh, and then be released. But sometimes people end up in these hospitals for the rest of their life. They're never better or for much longer than they might have served in jail uh, because they're waiting to be better. And that sometimes doesn't happen. 
but yeah, you would be released, right? And that happens, that happens a lot with this verdict. The biggest criticism is it's not fair, right? That this person, why did they get to go to a psychiatric hospital instead of jail? Now, some of these psychiatric hospitals are probably worse than jail, to be fair, right? It's just a different type of jail in a sense, um, depending on the facility that you go to. Some are quite nice and some are not. Uh, but that's the biggest criticism, that this isn't fair. How do we prove that they actually were insane? And again, it's a very difficult process to do. Lots of expert witnesses. I almost got to be an expert witness once. I was so excited. It was like uh, a friend of a, it was like the daughter of a client that I had. And like, I got to go, I went to court. I was in there, I was waiting. I was all ready to go. And then they didn't need me, which is probably good. Um, it would have been terrifying, but I was so excited. I was like, I'm going to go and I get to testify. And I didn't have to. Anymore. But uh, it's typically that, uh, you know, you have a whole panel. And again, a lot of screening, a lot of evaluation in order to get this verdict. Much more common are these three. These three are way more common, but we don't hear about them as much. They're not as dramatic. Um, guilty, but mentally ill. So if you are guilty, then we say that you are held accountable for the crimes you committed. You are guilty of those crimes, but you were also mentally ill at the time. But that mental illness wasn't enough to give you special circumstances or extenuating consideration. Right, so you had bipolar disorder and that might have played a role, but we still found you guilty. You were of sound mind, you go to jail. All right, so guilty but mentally ill means you go to jail and you receive psychiatric treatment in jail. Right, and so you would be incarcerated like normal, um, but we found you guilty with mental illness. So we, we've kind of put that down, but it wasn't enough to change anything. You would go to jail just like somebody who didn't have a mental illness, but receive treatment while you're there. Guilty with diminished capacity is another way this can show up. So with this one, we say that your mental dysfunction, your mental illness that you had was enough of an extenuating circumstance that we're gonna take it into consideration when determining how much of a sentence or what crime we are finding you guilty of. You're still guilty. We're still finding you guilty, but let's say, let's go with murder, right? Somebody commits a murder. Instead of first degree murder, we find you guilty of manslaughter which is a lesser, um, a lesser verdict, a lesser sentence. We've taken into account your diminished capacity, your mental illness, and it's helped you to have a lesser sentence and a lesser uh, charge brought against you. So these ones are actually very, very common. And you don't hear about them nearly as much in the media, but both of them mean you are guilty. Both of them, you go to jail, but with either a lesser verdict and a lesser sentence or um, just going like normal, but receiving treatment while you're there. The one other thing that we can sometimes see, because all of the ones we've talked about so far have to do with at the time of the crime, sometimes things happen because of a crime, right? Maybe the crime that someone committed caused them to become insane, or it caused them to affect their, uh, their mental status in some way, and they're no longer able to stand trial and defend themselves. If somebody is mentally incompetent to stand trial, what we're seeing is they're not able to understand the charges that are being brought against them. They're not able to defend themselves. They're not able to prepare an adequate defense with their lawyer because they're no longer of sound mind. So maybe something happened between the crime and the trial and they're no longer able to understand what's going on. They've maybe had like a psychotic break or like an episode of something. Somebody who's found mentally incompetent to stand trial goes to a psychiatric hospital until they're better. Once they get better, then they would be um, released and they stand trial like normal. Now they could be there for days, months, years, forever. There have been some people who were found mentally incompetent to stand trial. They go to a psychiatric hospital, they never get better. But typically this is like months or weeks, right? Where somebody goes in, they get their medication under control, um, they get some help, they, they kind of get back to a balance. And then they would go through the legal proceedings like normal, right? But if someone is in a state where they can't understand what's going on, it's not fair to try them like everyone else, right? So we go get them help and then they stand trial um, like everyone else would and they could get one of the other verdicts that we talked about. And again, these can get so complicated. What you often see 
is that there'll be a trial and they come up with a verdict and then someone appeals it and they have a second trial or a third trial or a fourth trial. Uh, these can kind of go on and on and on and on. Uh, but those are some of the common verdicts that we see. These ones being relatively common and then um, also not guilty by reason of insanity, which is hard to get, but, uh, but definitely one we hear about in the media. Right. Any questions or thoughts or comments or anything before we look at some frightening people, interesting people, interesting and frightening people? Right. So uh, what I have on this next slide is a, a list, I think it's like 13 different individuals or, or groups of people um, who have had insanity as some part of the trial in some way. Maybe they pleaded it or they were granted it, um, but it was in some way one of these verdicts was part of their trials. Uh, and so what I'm gonna do is I'll show you their pictures and I'm gonna give you just a tiny bit of information, just a little like intro to what they did. Um, and then we're gonna get into groups and we're gonna spend some time looking at them a little bit more. Uh, but let me, uh, let me introduce them. And I'm sure you've heard of a lot of these people. These are very um, notorious people in a way. Let me bring them all up. And again, this is kind of a frightening slide of people, right? Uh, to, to look at, but uh, starting at the top, right? So Andrea Yates or Andrea Yates, I've heard it both ways, uh, had postpartum psychosis. So as a result of having multiple children, multiple pregnancies, she developed a psychosis and she drowned her five children in the bathtub, um, thinking that they weren't developing correctly. Um, so that's what she was, was known for. Uh, Jeffrey Dahmer, or one of the more like infamous uh, of the serial killers, killed 15 to 17 um, young men, cut his victims into pieces um, and hid them throughout um, his home and throughout all sorts of different places. Jeffrey Dahmer, Ed Gein, right? The Wisconsin grave robber. He was a murderer and grave robber who would remove the skin um, of victims and sew body parts and furniture and clothing out of them. A uh, lot of movies inspired by him like Texas Chainsaw Massacre and uh, and others. Uh, John Wayne Gacy, the clown up there, um, the clown killer. Um, he didn't actually dress up as a clown when he committed um, his murders, but he would go to children's parties as a clown, um, which is slightly frightening to think of. Uh, but Gacy uh, committed sodomy and murder. He 30 plus boys that he murdered and buried in the crawl space beneath his home. John Hinckley Jr. on the top, uh, top up there tried to assassinate President Reagan to impress actress Jodie Foster, wrote her a whole letter um, trying to impress her and get her attention. Really interesting, the letter is really interesting to read. David Berkowitz underneath him, um, the son of Sam Killer in New York, killed six victims and wounded several others um, through shooting attacks. Underneath him, Kenneth, uh, Kenneth Bianchi, the Hillside Strangler, who uh, kidnapped and sexually assaulted quite a few women. Francine Hughes on the bottom set her husband on fire while he was sleeping as a result of years and years of abuse. Uh, these two, Anissa Weyer and Morgan Geyser, one of the more um, like current cases, these two, uh, they were two 12 year old girls at the time. They stabbed a young girl 19 times uh, to impress Slenderman. It was from the, the creepy pasta website, fictional character Slenderman stabbed her a bunch of times. She lived, uh, but they, uh, you know, obviously had some severe consequences for that, but uh, to impress a, a fictional character. Uh, let's see, next to them, Mark David Chapman. Mark David Chapman assassinated John Lennon, and then he sat there at the scene reading Catcher in the Rye, um, waiting for the police to arrest him. Lorena Bobbitt, famous for cutting her husband's penis off and then throwing it out a window. They did find it and sew it back on, as a side note, um, but uh, as a result of years and years of abuse. Ted Kaczynski, uh, the Unabomber. Uh, he wrote the Unabomber Manifesto, sent bombs and packages uh, nationwide, um, known for, um, for his bombs and the development of those. James Holmes, the Colorado Joker killer, dressed up as the Joker, went into a movie theater in Colorado, and shot a bunch of people pretending um, to be the Joker. It was a Batman movie that he went into. I went to that theater two months before that happened, which is just crazy. I lived in Colorado at the time. Um, so I knew the theater and everything, but um, he killed quite a few people, 20 people. Um, he killed 12, shot 20, calling himself the Joker. And then uh, another newer one, Gypsy Rose Blanchard and Nicholas Godejohn, um, who had uh, 
did they, I can't remember if they killed her or they attacked her, right? I think they killed her, right? Um, there's a whole amazing like Netflix thing about this as well. So many of these people on Netflix, right? Um, as a result of some um, Munchausen by proxy kind of stuff that had happened throughout their life, um, boyfriend and girlfriend, some really interesting individuals. And there are more, but these are, are people who had insanity as some part of their either defense or legal proceedings. And so what I want you to do, let me see how many of you are there. Three, five, seven, eight, nine, eight, seven. Okay, so I'd like you to get into groups of like two to three people, two to three max. So it's up to you, it can be two or three. Um, and what I want you to do is I want you to look at this group of individuals um, that I feel like nervous standing so close to. Nervous and fascinated, right? They're, they're really amazingly interesting and terrifying. Uh, and I want you to think of, of one person that you would, or a group of people that you would really like to spend some time uh, researching. Come up with an alternative and a backup because we're not gonna have any overlap. So uh, as soon as you have a group of like two to three, decide who it is that you're interested in. Once you know that, raise your hand and I'll come around and uh, we'll like, I'll allow you all to pick your person and then we'll keep going and I'll tell you what we'll do from there. So as soon as you have an idea of who you want, raise your hand and I'll come around. But two to three people. Some time 
So the people that we're doing, or that all of you are going to get to uh, meet, can you please meet me and be these roles, and then Anita and Morgan. Uh, so a few people are being done. That's totally fine. We don't have that many people. All right, give me your attention just for a minute. Ready? Um, so what I want you to do, I'm going to give you the rest of our time today to work on this, so that you don't have to do this outside of class. Right? I don't want you to have homework. I know that we are at the end of the semester. These are busy enough, right? So what I want you to do as a group is I want you to do some research on your person or persons. A couple of you have more than one. Um, and so you can use your phones or your tablets or computers, whatever you have. But I want you to look at, give me a little bit of background about your person. Tell me about their life. Where did they grow up? A little bit about them. Then you're going to focus on what crimes did they commit, right? You don't have to go into gruesome detail, but enough that we understand what happened and what they did um, and why we're, we're talking about them. And then you're going to describe the legal proceedings and verdicts for that person. What happened in their trial? Where are they now? Right? Are they dead? Are they still in jail? Are they in the hospital? Like what happened to them? If there's any random or interesting bits of information, those are always fun. You can feel free to share those. But what you're going to do as a group is you're going to um, get all that information. And then next class, I'm going to have you present it to the class. Now, it's only like three, maybe four minutes at the most. It's short. Okay, but what I want you to do is give me an overview of those three bullets that are there along with where they are now and any other inter in interesting information. And I would like to ask that you at least have one like image or one slide or one something that you bring up here to, sh uh, to share. So what a lot of people will do is make like a slide or two to help them. Maybe it has some bullets or pictures on it. You can have images of the things they did. Just try not to make it like awful where none of us want to look at it and it makes us like sick to our stomach or something like that right but you can have images of the things they did that's fine or of them or what, whatever you would like to do um, and so what you can do right now is you can work on that research you can create that slide or that image together so that you don't have to do that later uh, when it comes to the presenting next class you can decide as a group who's going to do that you can all present together and split it up if you have one person who's like, I don't mind, or you can have them do it, that's totally fine. You can divide that up however you would like, um, and I'm fine with that. If you know that you're not going to be here, you can divide that up however you would like as well. Um, but what will happen next class is I'll give you a few minutes to meet with your group, and then we'll just go through each of the presentations. So you can email me your slide, and I'll have it ready for you, or you can bring it up on the computer next class, and it'll be there and ready. Um, but you should have plenty of time. You have about a half hour. That should be more than enough to get this done. If you finish, you're welcome to leave. If you as a group decide that you really want to work on this outside, I'm fine with that. You can go and work on it outside. If you want to stay here, I'm here. Um, and you can stay here. Uh, but that's what we'll do next class. And then you'll turn in this sheet when you present with your names on it um, to get credit for this activity. So 10-point activity. Okay, so what I'll do is I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to give you the rest of our time. And again, if you'd like to leave and work on it somewhere else, I'm all right with that. Or you can stay, and when you're done, you can go as well. And if you have questions, let me know. I'll be I'll be here. So go ahead and get started. Work on it together. Should be plenty of time to get it done. <laughs> So, you know, 